in peace like a river Attended my way With sorrows I seek with those Whatever Verses 31 through 36. Let's read those verses 
and let's break that down for the time that we have this morning. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 31, And Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Verse 36, Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Again, the title of the message is, The Keys to Experiencing Freedom. More specifically, the freedom to have joy and abiding in what God has ordained for us to walk in. See, here's something that we need to understand regarding the word freedom is that it is a word that is ingrained in the concept of our nation. If you take a look at America, America probably has more freedom than most countries around the world. And I've been to many of those countries where you're not able to openly preach the gospel out in the streets. You're not allowed to speak against your government based on the laws that they're making that are in contradiction to the Word of God. So we as Americans have more freedom than many of the countries, if not every country, all around the world. Even when we think about our military and the fact that they are fighting overseas, or they are here guarding our nations, lo nation locally or domestically, we think about them in the concept of preserving our freedoms. But here's an important thing that we need to understand regarding this issue of freedom, is that freedom doesn't mean you can do anything you want. I, I think that's very important for us to understand, especially in the world that we are in today, especially 2016 in America, freedom doesn't mean you get to do whatever you and I want. Here's what freedom does mean, is that you and I have the ability to operate within a set of pre-prescribed rules. Get that for me for a second here. Freedom doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. What it does mean is that you and I get to operate within a set of pre-prescribed rules, whether it's government, whether it's God, whether it's a family structure. So understand that even something like freedom has its limits, but we are in a time in America where freedom means you can do whatever you want, and if someone judges your behavior, you are uh, excoriated for that aspect. So, so we need to be very careful regarding this option. For example, let me give you an, uh, a good illustration. For instance, if you're driving down State Road 1 towards Lawrenceburg from St. Leon, one of the most annoying rides that you'll ever go through in your life. Mm -hmm. Because clearly when you get off of the interstate, the sign says, trucks should not be driving on this road, right? You've seen those signs. It's a big sign. So, you know, you think to yourself, it takes me 30, 35 minutes to get to work. If I go, you know, about 50 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour, you know, but I'm okay. Cops probably won't pull me over, right, Doug? Okay, so thanks for your permission. So, uh, so you know, cops are not going to pull me over. So you're, the speed limit is 45, and you get on that road, and all of a sudden there is a truck that shows up. And here's what I find interesting about truck drivers. I hope there's no truck drivers in here. They will spot you a quarter mile away. They know that you're coming at a certain speed, and they still decide to get in front of you. I'm just like, dude, what are you doing, man? You know, so then I have to break the speed. So here's what I'm trying to say. It's that 45, 50 miles an hour is my limit. So within that limit, I can go that speed, but if I decide to cross 45 or 50, 55 miles an hour, I make, make myself available or open myself up to finding out that there's consequences to crossing that line. So we need to understand that freedom works in the same way is that there's a pre-prescribed set of rules and we get to operate freely within that structure because if we walk outside of them, there are going to be consequences. Now let's look at this concept when we think about our walk and our relationship with God. After all, we're going to look at the words of Jesus. Think about this. In our walk with God, there are some freedoms which exist 
until we cross the line and then we face the consequences for them. I'll give you a great example and it started at the very beginning of creation. God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat of every single tree in the garden except that one. See, notice God had given them utmost freedom, so we don't know how many trees were in the garden, but we know that there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, if you partake of this tree, you're going to die. So they go into this garden, this, I'll just estimate, okay, I'll just say maybe there were 99, and there was one, which was the bad one. God said, you have the freedom to partake of the 99, but if you cross that boundary, and if you partake of this, there's going to be consequences. It is the same thing that we need to understand in our walk with God, that if we want to continue experiencing freedom, we need to understand what God has said, and how we need to operate within those set of rules. God does not give us rules so that He can be a bad Heavenly Father to us, God gives us rules for our protection. It is the same way that you as a parent, it is the same way as a father and mother. You set guidelines for your children, this is what you are supposed to do. Not because we want to be mean, but we want to protect you and guard your soul while you are under our care. And it is the same way that God, our Heavenly Father, operates. So this morning I want to share with you uh, three keys to freedom. We're probably going to only look at one and we'll look at the other two next week. Here's the biggest, most important, the one that we just don't seem to get our heads around, one that we seem to neglect quite a bit, and you can follow with me along your notes. First key to freedom that we're going to look at this morning is abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. Take a look at verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. What would make Jesus say such words? Jesus is extremely popular. Jesus has been doing miracles. Jesus has been proclaiming things to them regarding the kingdom of God. Why would, they, why would Jesus have to say such words? You have to understand that in Christianity, there are followers and that there are true disciples. There are people that simply go along for the ride. This is what my parents did. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is something I can check off my list. And then there are genuine disciples who want to be followers of Jesus Christ, who want to obey Him, who are willing to follow Him regardless of the cost. Yet we find that in Jesus' ministry, He still had people who weren't willing to give allegiance to Him. See, in verse 31, John says, those Jews who believed in Him, what does that mean? These were people who believed the words of Jesus, but weren't ready to pledge their allegiance to Him. They, they believed what Jesus was doing. They saw the great miracles that He was doing, but they just weren't ready to pledge allegiance to Him. They had the pressure of the religious leaders constantly on their back, looking to make sure that they truly were following Jesus closely. They wanted Jesus to keep doing more and more in their life until they could believe in Him. We have the same instance take place in John chapter 2 at the very beginning of John's Gospel. Look at verse 23. It says this, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, uh, during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Early on in Jesus' ministry, he's seen the same thing. The crowds are following him. By the way, just because crowds follow a certain movement does not make it right. Hello. Look at our country, look at our world. Just because crowds assemble for a purpose, it does not make it right. You know what it makes me understand and think about? When Jesus says in Matthew chapter 1, why is the gate that leads where? It leads to destruction and eternal punishment. But narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. There are more people who are going to be in hell than there will be in heaven because they have been swayed by the influence of this world. Jesus wanted authentic disciples. Look at it again. That Jesus said to those who believed in Him, If you abide in my word, 
You are my disciples indeed. Well, let's clear up something, first of all, about the word are in there, okay? Because many times we might just gloss over it and say, okay, what's the big deal? Let's go on to the next verse. But here's what it is. It is a present tense word, and here isn't showing the requirements to be a disciple. This isn't showing what you and I need to do, the things that you and I need to conduct in order to be a disciple. So there isn't this checklist that Jesus is saying, okay, check this off, check this off, check this off, and you're good to do. No, that's not what it's saying. Here's the word that Jesus used. He says, if you are my disciples, it means this primarily refers to a learner or one who adheres to the teachings of a spiritual leader. Do you realize the world that you and I live in today, the country that you and I live in today, there are many people who even attend church, they are mesmerized by the work of Jesus Christ, but they fail to put their faith in Christ. They like everything about Jesus. He was kind, he was compassionate, he served others. You'll even see this within people that don't believe in God. They'll say Jesus is a good example of a good man and how we should be. But there's many people that are mesmerized by the work of Jesus Christ, but they fail to put their faith in Christ. Here's what Jesus is going to lay forth with his words. He's basically going to say this. If you are truly a disciple of Jesus's, you will live by His Word, walk like Him, and love like Him. If you are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, you simply can't give lip service. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church. No, no, no. The, the, the mandate that is there in the Bible for a true disciple of Jesus Christ is far higher than what you and I have given credit to it. If we are truly a disciple of Jesus's, we will live by His Word, we will walk like Him, and then we will love like Him. Isn't it taking it to a whole new level when we say that? Because it's a lot more than just saying, well, just pray this prayer and trust in Jesus, everything's going to be okay. Have you ever thought about that? We do that sometimes. When people come to us with problems, we say, you know what, here's the, here's the remedy. Just pray this prayer, say, Jesus, I accept you into my heart, and then everything is going to be okay. What Jesus is saying is this. He is saying, the way that you behave yourself, the way that you speak, the way that you live, everything about your life will show that you truly belong to Jesus. Jesus said the same thing when he says, if you are truly my disciples. Here's what human beings say a disciple is, and here's what God says a disciple is. Next point is this, is that Jesus is saying that those who are truly disciples of His will live in obedience to His Word. See, there's one thing to say that I am a Christian, but then there's another thing to say that I am truly a Christian because I'm abiding according to what the Word of God says. Everything in my life is conforming myself to what God is requiring of me in His Word. So there are people that are cultural Christians they go to church because mom and dad went there, grandparents went there. It's just something that you get to do on Sunday, and then you go to Harrison to have a meal, right? There's those people, and then there's people that say, I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. Part of going to church means that I'm with other saints, following the Word of God, edifying one another, coming together to show and to be evidence of the fact that we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. There is a big difference. John chapter 14, Jesus says this, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Do you, do you think God is trying to communicate something to us here? You simply can't pray a prayer to accept Jesus Christ, and there be no evidence in your life that you have been a child of God. A child of God truly will live by the words of God in His word. Everything in our life will conform to that. First John chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 6. 
John says, He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, by the word way that word commandments means teachings, is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word truly, the love of God is perfected in him or matured in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Wow. Are you telling me, Pastor Dave, that if I am a Christian, I am supposed to walk the same way that Jesus walked? If God's word is true and if this verse is in the Bible, that is exactly what it's saying. I can just call it an invitation right now and go home, right? I mean, that is convicting. That if I am truly a child of God and if I am abiding in Him, that is what I'm going to do. I am going to walk the same way that Jesus did. I'm going to do everything in my life to make sure that it conforms to the Father's will and what He desires for my life and that I'm living in obedience to His Word. That is authentic, genuine Christianity. Christians who say that I am living the way that God has told me to do. Not this mentality that says, well, who are you to judge me? The Bible has a higher standard. A couple of thoughts that I thought about regarding this, and I'll share them with you after this quote. Here's what this quote says. What does it mean to abide in His Word? What is the definition of that? Here's what it means. Welcoming it. Being at home with it. And living with it so continuously that it becomes part of the believer's life. A permanent influence and stimulus in every fresh advance in goodness and holiness. See, whenever we think about our Christian walk with God, whenever we talk about the way that we ought to be obeying God, we almost dissect them. We say, you know what, here I am, here's my life. And over here, here's obedience, here's walking with God, when God actually is saying the two need to be meshed together. That what God desires for my life will be inside of my heart, and what is inside of my heart will naturally flow into other tributaries in my life. The Word of God does not give us the convenience of separating our Christian walk from our secular walk, from our family walk, from our others, from other walks. God is saying, you need to take my Word, let it abide in you, and everything that flows out of your life comes out of my Word that is abiding in you. Because if it is not my Word that is flowing out, it is your flesh that is flowing out. Why is it that so many Christians aren't living by the Word. You ever think about that? Why is it that there are so many Christians that aren't living by the Word? I have a simple answer for you. Because they are not in the Word. It's plain and simple. Why are there so many Christians that aren't living according to the Word of God? Because they are not in the Word of God. Second question is this. Why don't we have a passion to share the gospel with those who are lost around us, it is because we don't read about God's passion in the Bible to reach those who are lost. Why do we have a worldly mindset in many facets of our life? Because we have not been transformed by the power of God's Word. You need to understand something. If I need to have passion in my life to serve God, to share the Gospel, I find that passion, that obedience, everything that God desires for my life to be, I find it in the Word of God. If I am not in the Word of God, I have no idea what has influence in me when I am living in this world. By the way, if God's Word isn't residing in my heart, then something else is. Remember that. If God's Word isn't abiding in my heart, then something else is. And that something else is giving me power to live out my flesh in this world. Jesus says, if you abide in my Word, you are truly my disciples. How can I be a child of God? By studying the Word of God. I've thought about this, is that we have time for everything in our lives. We truly do. We even have a time when we set our televisions. If we can't be at home, we can DVR it, right? So that when we come home, we can find out the, what happened during the game, what happened.
happened during Dancing with the Stars, you know, what happened with all these different shows. We have time to do these things. And yet I find that everything that I have time for has no eternal value. No wonder we are in the condition that we are, not just as a country, but more specifically as individuals, where we lack a joy of abiding in the Word of God. Look at verse 32. This is not a hypothetical statement that Jesus is about to make. Jesus is not saying here, well, it may work, it may not work, it has a 10% chance of succeeding. In verse 32, Jesus says this, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Look at it again in verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice what verse 32 is doing. Notice what Jesus is doing. Jesus is connecting this aspect of truth setting a human being free, and he's connecting it directly with what's in verse 31. If you are abiding in the Word of God, if you are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have a knowledge of God, you have the fruit of regeneration in your life. If you are abiding in the Word of God, you are going to know what the truth is, and that truth that is lived out will continue to give you freedom for the rest of your life. Folks, that's how it works. I can understand what freedom is when I understand the Word of God. If I'm abiding in Christ and everything else starts to flow out of that, Jesus says, if you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Here's something else that I've, when I was reflecting on this, and here's why I said it was going to take me more than a week to finish this sermon. Is, here's the reason is that when we think about the word truth, when we think about free, I thought about another word. I thought about the word knowledge. I thought about the word knowledge. Knowledge is something that our world has greatly advanced in, but I'm using it in a secular sense. Our world today has advanced greatly in a secular sense in terms of knowledge. In terms of being able to do more things, invent more things. When we have so much advancement, for example, when we look at something like technology, we can speak with people on the other side of the world with an app. I keep in touch with many of my relatives in Dubai and in India with a, uh, an app called WhatsApp. Okay, So uh, we have time to sit there and talk. Now, what's amazing is cell phones and texting and stuff, they always thought they were for like the younger generation. Now here's what's happened in my family, is my dad, my mom, their siblings from overseas have decided to tag me in on this conversation, and thankfully I don't get notifications from them, but anytime I open them up, there have been about 80 to 90 messages that have been exchanged between them. I'm going, man, you guys, you guys are like little kids here, you know, like, they're jabbing each other, they're making fun of each other, so on and so forth. But what's amazing is that we have technology that just with a cell phone, I can touch an app and I can communicate with someone on the other side of the world. We have so much technology that we can fly drones without having anyone in there, like even airplanes, and we can drop bombs on terrorists. Advancement in technology. You can do million dollar transactions with one touch on your cell phone screen. But how about us as human beings? With all the advancement, with all of the things that are out there, with technology and information, what has that done to us as human beings? Have human beings advanced? <laughs> I would say probably not. I believe that with technology, that even though it is good, we have become enslaved to it. And I speak of myself even as well. Let me give you a good example. It's social media. How is it that we can claim to be social without having to communicate with someone face to face? Hello? We, we call it social media, we call it Facebook, and yet you never talk to a person face to face. We crave relationships. We have 800 friends, 1,000 friends. We claim to have this life, this digital life, but at the end of the day, we are still lonely, we are still depressed, we are still without hope. 
How can that be when we are so advanced? What it tells me is that without Christ at the center of your life, human beings are always going to be searching. They're always going to be empty. They're always going to be hopeless. We don't know how to verbalize our thoughts anymore because we have the scapegoat of texting a few words to each other. So much advancement in the world. So much technology. People are doing great things. People are building great things. People have a way of communicating from one side of the world to the other. Yet with all of this advancement, we are still lonely, hopeless people. And our world gives evidence of it. Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and that truth shall set you free. How can Christians know the truth and live the truth that makes them free? How can we do it? How can we experience this freedom? Where do we go for this? Let me share with you a few thoughts. Number one, a person can know through the power of regeneration. Simply by that I mean that someone who has been transformed by the power of the gospel. A person can know through the power of regeneration. John 1.17, John says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Through the power of the gospel we are transformed. Through the power of the gospel we are made right with God. Through the power of the gospel we have been reconciled to God when we were separated in Adam. It is because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and me trusting in Christ that I have been reconciled to God. And I can know the truth because I know the source of truth. Number two, a person can know through the work of the Holy Spirit. I think the third person of the Trinity is something we rarely talk about. We never talk about it. We talk about God the Father. We talk about God the Son. And then we say, well, you know what? We'll allow the charismatics of the Pentecostals to pick up God the Holy Spirit. That's what we do, right? We will stick with God the Father, God the Son, and those who are charismatic and Pentecostal, well, they can handle God the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is given to every believer. At the moment of salvation, we can know the work through the work of the Holy Spirit. We can know the truth. John 15, 26. Jesus, talking about His de departure, says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of Me. If you want to understand discernment regarding the Word of God, and if you want to know what the truth is, when you look at the world through the scope of the Bible, the Holy Spirit is the one that teaches you about who God is, what God requires, and it illuminates your minds and hearts to that truth. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we have that. John 16, 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. It is amazing to me that God not only saves us, but God gives us guidance until he takes us home. Think about the rest of the world for a second here. Think about every system that is out there teaches a concept of works. That if you work your way to God, you can try to do all these good works and then maybe God will be satisfied with you when you see Him face to face. And yet people try to live it out in their own flesh. Have you ever tried to live out in your own flesh? How did that work out for you? Did it bring you peace and joy and hope or did it bring calamity and chaos into your life? Well, what amazes me is that God not only saves us from eternal punishment, but that God does something absolutely amazing. He says, I'm going to come and live inside of you. What? You want to live inside of me? Hey, man, no, 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 don't, don't do that. I don't think this is a good idea. You know, I am in my flesh. You know, I sin. I mess up. You sure you want to be doing this? And God says, absolutely. So not only does He save us, but His Spirit comes in and dwells us, 
And that spirit that is living within us is the truth. It is fully God. And it helps us understand the Word of God. And it transforms everything in our life to make sure that we are headed towards the goal of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. God is amazing that He doesn't just leave us alone. But that He indwells us with Himself. So that we can know everything about Him. So that we can know the truth in a world that's full of chaos and confusion. We can know through the power of regeneration. We can know through the work of the Holy Spirit. We can know through the Scriptures. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for the instruction in righteousness. Now look at the promise here, that the man of God may be complete. He may be complete, thoroughly <coughs> equipped, for every good work. God has given us His Word, not just so that it can be something that we check off of our list, but that it's something that will help us to transform areas in our life that are not lining up with what God desires for us. How many times have you read the same passage multiple times and you read it a tenth time and you're like, I get it. You know, that just didn't really click to me and I just read it for the tenth time. I finally understand. There are times when you read your devotions, maybe you read your daily bread, when you read your Bible, and you're going through something in your life, and the next day the devotional lines up just like your life, and you're like, God's dealing with me. You come to church, you listen to a sermon based on something that you're going through, it lines up. That's what it's doing. The Word of God is there to pierce your soul, to make sure that you are abiding, that you are following with what God desires for your life. The problem isn't that God hasn't given us enough. The problem isn't that God hasn't spoken. The problem is we are not abiding. It is a human problem, not a God problem. Jesus says this, you shall know the truth. Then he says this, the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make you free. I'm going to spend the rest of my time here, the, the moments that we have, talking about this issue. The truth shall make you free. This is the defining question in our country today. It is the defining question. It is the same question that Pilate asked when Jesus was standing before him in John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? And why will the truth make me free? The defining question for us as Christians. You realize that you simply can't hide behind America was a Christian country anymore. Do you realize that? Yeah, you know, it amazes me how many people sometimes are like, well, this is a Christian country. We could never do that. I love when people say those words. We could never do that. We would never do that. Folks, I want you to think about something. Think about how many children have been murdered in the womb in the last 40 to 50 years. Think about everything that we are proving when we distort God's idea of marriage. Think about these things that we have done that are in contradiction to the Word of God. The country doesn't need more laws. The country needs a revival. The country needs people who are willing to step up and share the gospel with those who are lost around them. Instead of pointing fingers at them, instead of condemning them, instead of looking down and disdain on them, we need to share the gospel with them. God never said someone's life is going to be transformed if they have a Christian country. God says someone's life is going to be transformed if Jesus comes into their hearts and saves them. Why will the truth make me free? Here's what's amazing in our country especially is that more and more you're seeing the rise of subjective morality. Subjective morality. That means morality that is determined by the individual rather than by God. This is the way I feel, therefore I should be able to do it. That's the new mantra. And who are you to judge? I should be able to do 
whatever I want. For instance, a great example of this happened last week. For instance, in Orlando, we had a gunman who walked in and shot down 50 individuals, and he had claimed to have allegiance to radical Islam. He was influenced by ISIS. But what amazes me is that a country that believes in subjective morality decided to blame everything else but radical Islam. And you saw that. People said, well, you need to blame guns, you need to blame the First Amendment, you need to blame the Second Amendment. They even decided to blame Christians because they said Christians discriminated and the list went on and on and on. That is what happens when you have subjective morality because what subjective morality does, it blurs the lines of morality and therefore when you look at something, it is hard to come to a definite conclusion whether something is right or wrong. And that is what is happening today. Jesus says, the truth, you will know it, and the truth will make you free. Do you realize that the more freedoms our society pushes for, the more bondage we are going into. Have you thought about that? The more freedoms that we end up pushing, the more bondage we are going to go into. The more sin that is promoted, the more guilt and shame, shame is stamped on the human soul. And you know what's amazing is that we as Christians do the exact same thing. We do the exact same thing. Let me, let me illustrate it for you this way. Let's talk about the first idea of sin. But here's what, what, here's what the world does. We all know that we were created perfect in God's image. Out of all of God's creation, God said to Adam and Eve, they are important, they matter, because they're the height of my creation, they have been created in my image. It is not said about any of other uh, God's creation except for human beings. So as you can see, I'm standing here without anything on me right now except my clothes. I'm in total freedom, and that's the way that God created. Complete freedom. There is no baggage. This is what God intended. Freedom so that I can worship God freely. There is no baggage. But here is what the world has done. Here's how the world has distorted it. The world has said, you know what? We like freedoms. We like subjective morality. We want to be able to do whatever we want. So here's what the world does. The world decides to add the baggage of sin. And so that's what it starts to look like, is the world says, you know what, I want to live however I want, so I'm going to put on sin. Oh, this is not bad. You know, sin's not that bad, but I start to find that it starts to become a little more difficult to worship God. And the world says, you know what? No one's going to judge you. Do whatever you want. It's okay. Do what's on your heart. Follow your heart. And then people say, fine. I'll take up another bag. This one, by the way, kind of gets hard to raise my hand and worship to God, right? And that's what sin continues to do. We add more and more weight to the point where we come to find out that we're carrying the bondage of sin. So here's what the world has said. The more you sin, the more you want to be in your lifestyle, it's okay because you're experiencing freedom, but yet what the world does not realize, the more sin baggage they end up carrying, the more bondage they find themselves in. They're walking around like this for the rest of their lives. No hope of someone taking this away from them. But you know what I find also amazing? is that it is true that we can say this of the world. That the world has a sin problem to add to this baggage. But we as Christians kind of do the same thing. It's not necessarily a sin issue, but you know what it is? It's this issue. We know that the Bible tells us that works is a good thing because it is an evidence of the fact that we are a child of God. And that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying is this, is that sometimes we think this will somehow make God happy with us all of a sudden. There's a difference. We abide in Christ, we're a disciple of His, it's part of our life. But we, we as Christians do, we say, you know what, I, I need to do more works. You know, I, I didn't get to read those eight verses this morning, so I better go home and I better make sure that I read them, otherwise God's going to be really upset with me. You know what, I, I just 
this, you know, I, I need to do one more thing because, you know, I, I feel like I haven't done enough for God, and God is out there judging me, so we decide to, to, to take one more piece of baggage on to our lives. And then we do the same thing, you know what, I haven't been really following God, and I think God is really mad at me, and, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, so I better just go out there and volunteer and do service so that God will be happy with me, and then what do we do? We end up going to the bondage of works. Folks, do you realize that when God saved us, it had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with God putting His wrath on His Son, Jesus Christ, on my behalf. So when I want to worship God, it has nothing to do with what I have done. It has everything to do with what God has done on my behalf. Yes, we realize that the world lives in bondage, but we as Christians sometimes can get so busy checking off a list because we think God is mad at us. When He sees us actually perfect because we have Christ in us. So let the things that you do in your life for God be out of a grateful, thankful heart, not because you think God is going to strike you dead because you haven't checked off the list. That is called bondage. John 14, 6. I'll try to wrap it up here. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have freedom, number one, from the falsehoods of Satan. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. 13 and 14. For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. As Christians, we can know the truth because Satan seeks to attack us. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place for our souls. But when we embrace it, when we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we can know how to defeat those attacks. Number two, we have freedom from the bondage of sin. Romans 8.22 But now, since you have been liberated from sin and have enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the end is eternal life. Isn't that amazing? God saves us from the bondage of sin. I can take these bags of sin and just go put them on the cross because Jesus Christ took my sin upon Himself. I have freedom from condemnation and judgment. Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I am free from condemnation. If you are a child of God this morning, you don't have to fear death, you know why? Because there's no condemnation for you. Because you have the righteousness of Christ. Number four, we have freedom from spiritual ignorance. John 8, 12, that Jesus spoke to them again saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I can know which way to go. I can know what God desires for my life. I can walk in His steps of truth because He is light. And His light resides within me. And I know how to obey Him. And lastly, I can have freedom from spiritual death. Freedom from spiritual death, Colossians 1. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Folks, that is true freedom. I am free in Christ because the bondage of sin has been taken off of me. I am free. I don't have to try to do things in order to please God because all He requires is faith in the Son of God. I close with this last quote. It says, there is nothing like the freedom we can have in Jesus Christ. No money can buy it, no status can obtain it, no works can earn it, and nothing can match it. It is tragic that not every Christian experiences this freedom 
which can never be found except by abiding in God's Word and being Jesus' disciple. Are you free today? Are you truly experiencing and living in freedom? You know, I find myself in bondage the most when I try to do it on my own. You try to make things happen. You try to do things. And yet, what the Bible is saying that you can be liberated, you can have freedom when you take your hands off the situation. You know how many times when we were in the process, and I'll close this, when we're in the process of trying to look for a building, you know how many times we try to put our hands to the plow and nothing happened? We tried. We tried, we tried, we tried. We talked to the banks. We talked to people that could give us loans. We talked to contracts. We kept talking. We tried to do it over and over again. But you know what I realized? I can't make it happen. It is God that's got to make it happen. There was bondage in trying to make things happen for the kingdom of God, but there is freedom in taking my hands off of it and let God work His own kingdom. Folks, we belong to God's kingdom. He is the king. Let him decide the rules and we'll simply follow. That's what he's asking us to do, to abide in his word. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for this time that we have together. Father, we are reminded in this world that is so confusing, so chaotic. There's spiritual darkness everywhere. Lord, I thank you that the light that shines in this world is the church. A church made up of imperfect people that have horrible pasts, that have a sinful nature still. But Lord, it is your light in our lives that continues to radiate even to the darkest places of this world. And Father, I pray that you would allow us to understand that this life is temporary, but what's to come is eternal, so that everything in our lives, Lord, that we would start to invest in what's to come. Father, I pray that we would allow your light to shine through our lives. Let it begin first by us abiding in your word. Help us not to ignore it. Help us not to simply follow it when it's convenient, but help us to do it, Lord, because we are your disciples. Lord, help us to experience the freedom that you have laid out for us. Lord, so many times in our lives we, we want to take this checklist and then mark it off so that we think that we can be right in your eyes. But Father, we are already right in your eyes if we, if we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to serve you not out of bondage but out of freedom. Taking our hands off the situations, Lord, and letting you be in the driver's seat. Father, thank you for the convicting power of your word that allows us to see clearly. Thank you for giving us the truth and that truth that makes us free. Father, speak to every single heart here, Lord, just in these few moments that we have for invitation. Lord, help us to reflect. Help us to think on, Lord, what you have desired for us to do. And help us to walk in that freedom. Father, I pray that if there is someone here that does not know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that you would convict their heart right now. That they would trust you as their Savior. That they would ask for forgiveness of their sins. That they would look only to Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would save them. Lord, just speak to our hearts, Lord, just these few moments that we have of invitation. And Lord, help us to transform our walk with you, Lord, starting first by abiding in your word. We're asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed, eyes closed, just for these few moments that we have. Just between you and the Lord. Ask God to change your heart, to transform it to what He desires. give you opportunities to share His light to those who are around you. Lost people all around you. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask God to give you opportunities to be wise, to be full of grace, to share His truth.
with them. Father in heaven, Lord, I do pray that as we close out our time today, you would help us again to align our will with your will. Lord, help us to be disciples, not just in speech, but in life and practice. And Lord, in all things, that you would get all the honor and glory. We thank you, and we praise you again, Father, for your word. We thank you for this time that we've had together as the body of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As we close out our service with some uh, announcements, and then if I can uh, break, and would you mind closing us out in prayer, please? That would be great. Uh, please take a look at the announcements that are in your bulletin. If you don't have the bulletin, please uh, take it on your way out. Also take the notes for next Sunday as we will continue to go through this. Uh, but just again to share with you a few announcements. Our, our students are going to be leaving this week for camp. Uh, if you could please pray for them that God would transform their hearts, that He would speak to them uh, so that they can draw closer to Him and that it can have fruit uh, in the time to come. So remember that, remember no Bible study. Uh, we're doing some work on our church, so trying to transition us uh, in there as soon as possible. Uh, also, there are some track booklets in the back. Uh, if you want to share some of those with people around you, please pick them up. They're free of cost in the back. I think they'd be very beneficial to you. Uh, and again, as you dads, as you walk out, Please pick the CD up in the back. It is for you. It has two books on there. One of them is by a guy named Kent Hughes, Disciplines of a Godly Man. And another one is by a gentleman called Donald Whitney. He has a book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. I think you will find this valuable to you uh, in your walk with God as you seek to grow uh, more in Him. I have one more announcement. Uh, uh, Amy or Tim, Tim, if you want to come up here and share the announcement. Tim, actually, if you don't mind closing this out, that would be great since you're up there already. Actually, Randy, promise. Yes. Um, the other one that's on here is July 23rd. We're going to have just a kind of a church-wide uh, get-together. We're going to have great food and just have a good time. Uh, no pressure. If you don't like to cook or whatever, just come anyway. If you don't look as good as Speedo as you used to, you don't have to wear a swimsuit or anything. We'll have lots of opportunities to play. We have a pavilion, so we can get out of the sun a little bit, uh, play a little cornhole or whatever, play a little golf, whatever you want to play. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of things going on. We have a sign-up sheet in the back, and we'll have food sign-ups. Um, and don't worry, like I said, too much about the food. You bring your favorite dish, and we'll all eat it, I promise. So uh, we'll take care of the meat. I think we're going to have, like, pulled pork and uh, whatever, pulled chicken, pulled pork or something. Um, so if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask Amy or I, but it should be a good time. We can stand up as we're closing out our word of prayer. If you have something else going on during the day and you just want to come for dinner, come at 5 o'clock. So that's when we'll have the dinner. So I know Saturdays are pretty busy for folks, but uh, if you're only able to come for the dinner, come at 5 o'clock uh, just to give you that uh, open opportunity. All right? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today to hear your word. We thank you for David and his leadership, Lord. Pray for each and every soul here, Lord. If there's someone here who doesn't know you, pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would burn them. Talk to someone about what they've heard today, Lord. Uh, we pray that you be with us as we go throughout our week. Burn us to be in your word, uh, to be uh, fed by it this week, Lord, that we might not sin against you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.